Welcome to another episode of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio show and podcast featuring your physician host, Dr. Tom McGovern. And I'm Dr. Chris Stroud, and this is the show where we and our guests discuss relevant health-related topics and always from an authentically Catholic perspective. Now, Dr. Doctor is brought to you in part by the generous underwriting of our friends at CMF Curo. Learn more at mycatholichealthcare.org. Live your Catholic faith in your health care with CMF Curo. Today, our guest will be heard across the EW. WTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Joining us will be Dr. William Stigel, a pe- pediatrician who is a pediatric intensivist who will explode your mind regarding the reality of in vitro fertilization. You know, he lent us the notes that he uses to teach a class in bioethics at the University of Dallas. I was amazed at how much I didn't know about this subject. It struck me kind of at a, a visceral level. I suspect it may affect our listeners also as I hear William explain science morality, and theology, as only William can. So Chris, while many in our society would consider in vitro fertilization, air quotes, settled science, or quote, settled morality, many of us don't. Why do you think it's important for us to discuss this topic on Dr. Doctor? Yeah, we could go on and on about this topic, couldn't we? Because it, it, it encompasses so much um, morality and sound moral teaching. I mean, we're talking about the dignity of the human person when the human person is just one or two cells uh, old, so to speak. So it really is foundational, at least in my humble opinion. It's foundational for everything else we think about as Catholic Christians. How often do you see a patient in your clinic who has been or is considering in vitro fertilization, even though it's something you do not do? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a fair representative sample. Because, Certainly not. Yeah, people choose <laughs> me because I don't do IVF. So I'm the antithesis in my community to the IVF guy. But I do see patients, a lot of patients who have been to IVF, and there is this epiphany that often happens that I think we're going to talk about. We're going to try to make more epiphanies happen by our discussion yes. with William. But, you know, I've heard couples literally describe sitting in the waiting room at the IVF clinic and realized this is wrong. We, we can't do this. Uh, it's against everything that we believe. Let's get out. Mm-hmm. But the, the sad reality that's going to come out, I know, in our discussion is that many, many, many couples find themselves feeling as though they're caught choosing between their faith and their desire to be parents Um, and feeling like there's no way out of that. Um, And we're going to help them, I hope, I think, understand that that's not the case. And, you know, this seems to segue in with the question I wanted to ask you next, Chris, since this is part of your specialty. Um, What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions people have about IVF? Well, maybe the misconception is there is that you can't be Catholic and treat infertility. Yeah, that, that, that's clearly a big misconception. Um, but, but it's interesting. I, I think most people just don't stop to think about what's happening ah. because no one really wants them to stop and think about what's happening. And boy, we're going to get that in spades today. Yeah. I mean, I, I love the analogy, and we're going to talk about it, but for those of us that have more than one child, imagine that horrible dilemma where in some scenario, sort of a bad movie, where a parent has to choose which of their children would live. Oh, Sophie's choice, yeah. It's a terrible, terrible scenario, yet that happens every single time IVF is attempted. You've got children, some of them are going to succeed, and some of them are going to fail, and you're going to decide which ones. People don't think about that until it's often too late. Yeah, that's a power we don't deserve. I think the other thing that's tough to hear, and it's tough to say, and that is this reality that every couple is not called to biologic parenthood. Um, children are not a right. right. They're a gift. Yes. If they were a right, they'd be property. And we're going to touch on this concept of child as property with our guest. But it may be that you're not called to biologic parenthood. Nobody wants to hear that. And no physician, no. other than maybe the ones in this room, want to say that. Yet people have to hear it. And they're, always, I think, often surprised to hear me say that. Very good. You know, uh, for our listeners, we've had Dr. Kevin Majors on many times, and we owe getting to meet Kevin through our guest today, William Stigel. So we owe him a lot. And plus, I found something that seems to, to connect with what we've learned from Kevin. So 
When discussing emotions and anger and flow, Kevin reminds us that the bonds we have with other are always more important than any kind of project outcome that we're trying to seek. And so, and I'm going to connect this up with IVF. So IVF has parallels with what Kevin says about flow versus hyperfocus. In flow, a person's completely present in the moment. The whole person is committed to what they're doing. They're finding joy in the process. And he told us that in hyperfocus, which can look like flow, and a great example of hyperfocus is playing video games, you're not so much enamored with the process of what you're doing. You want the best score. And it wasn't a good event, a good thing to do unless you've got the score. So in flow, there is goodness regardless of the outcome. In hyperfocus, there is subjective goodness only if the outcome is the desired one. So in, in the lecture notes William gave me, he will be, in, in the on today's interview, he's going to be referring to the, quote, doctors and lab people as artisans, uh, scientists seeking to make a product or achieve a certain desired outcome, in this case, a baby made to specification. And in that process, there is no joy. You're only focused on the outcome. I mean, just wait till you hear all the steps necessary for in vitro fertilization. I had no idea. And if there are positive emotions related to IVF, they're only in the desired outcome, not the process. However, there is another mode of reproduction that has been around a long, long time. <laughs> and it's the natural outgrowth of a physical bond that represents the emotional and social bond between a husband and a wife. That union in itself is joyful and builds bonds regardless of the outcome. But sometimes there is the outcome of a baby that's procreated. So, Chris, I know I'm just rambling on as I want to do. What do you think about these analogies? Yeah, I am no theologian, as anyone that knows me or listens to our <laughs> show could, could attest. But, you know, when I hear you describe that, I'm reminded uh, that sometimes at a birth, I get reminded that this process is really, it, it's really Trinitarian. Mm. It really does mimic what happens between father and son, that the bond between them is so great and the love is so strong that it actually appears as another entity. Yes. And in the most beautiful yes. births that I get to attend, certainly not all of them, but in many of them, that's what happens before our eyes. There's a bond between man and woman that was physical and it was emotional, and a third entity yes. is produced as a result of that. IVF, as we'll learn, really bypasses that entity, makes it a process, not the miracle that it is. Amen. And before getting to William, we got to run through the medical trivia question of the day, which has the category male gametes. <laughs> I know gametes is a big little word, uh, <laughs> but it's basically referring to sperm. So during the typical time that a husband and wife unite in the marital act, there is an average of less than one egg available for fertilization since an egg is only available one or two days a month. However, with the man's gametes or sperm, the situation is starkly different. In a typical episode of the marital embrace, how many sperm does a man typically release? Multiple choice question. Is it closer to 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, or 100 million? You'll have to wait till the end of the show to hear the correct answer, but we'll be back with our guest William Stigel here on Dr. Doctor after the break. We're back with today's guest, William Stigel, talking about in vitro fertilization. William is uh, at the mic for his second trip on Dr. Doctor. He's a native Texan. He graduated undergrad from University of Texas in Austin in a business. He went to UT Southwestern Medical School. And then sometime during part of that process, he also got a graduate degree uh, in philosophy uh, at the University of Dallas. He then did a residency at UT Southwestern in pediatrics and then a fellowship in pediatric critical care. He, in fact, teaches a bioethics course at University of Dallas. He is married, has three children. William, welcome back to Dr. Doctor. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, you know, before we kick off with a fascinating conversation that I know we're going to have, we should probably pause for a minute um, and affirm something that's important, and that is children born through artificial cycles of IVF are children of God, um, and they deserve all of the love and the dignity of the human person that children conceived in the natural means do. I know sometimes I've been accused of thinking those children were less 
uh, less valued. And that's simply not true. We're talking about the way those children were conceived, not the value of those children. But having said all of that, let's get into uh, the meat of the matter and, and talk a little bit about a definition of in vitro as opposed to the opposite of that. William, what does that really mean? Well, first, I would I would just second your your thoughts there. That that's that's the whole point to all of this, right? Is that the reason why children produced by artificial reproductive technologies are due equal respect is because they have infinite worth, just like children conceived naturally in vivo uh, versus in vitro. Yeah, well said. So, uh, in vitro fertilization, the I N and then V I T R O there, it, it means on glass, in or on glass, and that opposes in vivo which means uh, within the living. Uh, that sounds like an, a trivia question, missed opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just let William have fun with it. Uh, so William, in discussing human sexuality, there are two terms bandied around, natural and artificial, like natural family planning, artificial birth control, or doing what comes naturally. Help us understand what natural and nature mean and how it's relevant to this discussion. You know, a lot of times people think nature uh, means sort of the worst of us, the least common denominator. Uh, you know, people cheat on their taxes by nature, right? Well, but actually the word <laughs> nature comes from the Latin natus, which means birth. Yes. So natural means things that have their own processes, their own purposes. They, can, they complete their ordering, they complete their activities by their own courses. So children grow up naturally to become adults. Puppies grow up naturally to become dogs. Artificial means, it comes from the Latin artifactiae, and artifactiae means uh, making. Uh, ours is uh, technique, the technical aspects of things. So things are made by art, and they're made by technical expertise. And facere means uh, to make. So uh, artificial means it's, it's made. So what's interesting about this is that man is by nature an artificer. Man is by nature an artisan. This is what this is Genesis one. When God yes. brings Adam right. in, what does he do? He, he names the animals, right? Yes. And, and naming is is sort of a is, is kind of an intellectual making. It's a mm -hmm. form of dominion that I I can recognize what it is and I can run do what it is. I can make it do my own things. But then Adam and Eve's first response after the fall is to make fig leaves, right? Yes. That our <laughs> our make. first response yes. is is to make. So man by nature is an artificer, and so where where we're going to get to today is what are the nature and limits of our nature? What are the nature and limits of artificial techniques when it comes to dealing with others of our nature? Well, it seems like a good segue and to ask the question, what does it mean then if we say in vivo fertilization is natural? So in vivo fertilization then, uh, fertilization that occurs in the body, in the living by nature. So making a baby, right, doesn't require anything on our part that's out, out of our nature. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in the most optimal conditions in, in the usual situation, the way babies are conceived happens because of all these natural activities that bring men and women close together, men and women's genitalia close together, men and women's gametes close together. That then results in a conception that then 90 years later ends their life. But none of that requires man to pull on the strings, make something to change the natural course given its natural purposes. So, so William, if we are naturally artificers or artisans, how do we distinguish when being an artisan is a good thing and when it's a bad thing? Absolutely. So th that that then you need to look at both the subjective and the objective, right? You need to look at the person. W what is the nature of our nature? What kinds of things are we? And then you look at how then are we to interact with the world around us? So this is a common, from the beginning of man telling himself about himself, man is this sort of bipole that we have this one like feature of us is we look like gods, but another like feature of us is that we look like animals. And so uh, this has been man's, this is a, the first story we tell of ourselves is, is, is a story called Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh has this entire, uh, this entire problem set of man, God and man beast. Um, the first n known piece of work of art uh, that we found is called the Stadel Lion. It's forty thousand years old. It's a it's an uh, it's a lion's head on a man's body. Ugh. This this role that we sometimes look like gods and sometimes look like animals, but man's neither of those things. We're in between, and so you have to have real reflection on what is it that we we are, and that will help you understand what we can and cannot do. Wow. So I, I have patients every day talk to me about how they value what's natural. Mm. Uh, and then I think a lot of times when people say that, they don't exactly know what they mean when they say natural. But 
in terms of when we're talking about fertilization, what makes natural better than artificial? Aren't they just sort of different ways to get the same thing? Yeah, I think I think this. So I think the recognition that people like natural things, right? The, the, the whole not even cottage industry anymore of right. natural foods, right? And so it has this sort of appeal, right? And then artificial has this sort of negative connotation to it, mm -hmm. but. But, but people aren't really clear about why is that. So one of the retorts I have about natural is, well, you know, uh, you know, diphtheria is also natural. Uh, <laughs> and, and so not anything by nature is good, sure. right? Um, so, so then again, it comes to, what, so what exactly do you mean by nature? And what we, we mean by nature in these discussions really is what's your essence? What kind of species mm. are you? And knowing what you are then imply what you ought and ought not do. Well, let's move on to sort of a... a a practical description of in vitro or IVF, in vitro fertilization. Now, there's a lot of steps to get this process done, but let's walk our listeners through each of them to give them a real sense of what we're discussing. And starting with the male, the, the simple part, right? Aren't, aren't we male simple? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we are, we are the, the, the simple side of the equation. And in, in vitro, we're so simple that we're not even, not that completely necessary. So I think this is one of the real aspects to this whole process of in, uh, of in vitro fertilization that we need to r really get our heads around when a man and a woman naturally have a baby. Uh, and I'm not talking about natural birth here. I'm talking about natural conception. Yes. When that happens, the usual situation is this physical bonding is a manifestation of a psychological bonding, an emotional bonding. Mm -hmm. After that bonding, they are closer together as people. They're, they're, they're united in one flesh, right? So the, the male in that situation can't be any other male than the father. Right. In artificial reproductive technologies like in vitro fertilization, the sperm, yes, that, that, that sperm will become the father of that child, but it could be anybody's sperm. Right. In fact, next to that sperm sample is another man's sperm sample is another man's sperm sample. And it may be a mix of sperm samples. It may be not the sperm sample you think it is. Right, so the the essential quality to what's going on in, in IVF isn't that there's a man who is given this sort of physical manifestation of his commitment to a woman. The the manifestation there in the male part of IVF is that he supplied bits of himself in a in a in a test tube. So if that part is simple, what's uh, the complicated part like? Well, this gets back to your, your trivia quiz. One of the reasons why that's so simple, right, is that sperms are cheap and eggs are expensive. Right. So women, to get women pregnant, it requires a lot of coincidental uh, occasions coming together. And so when you're going to then try to manipulate that to make it happen on our time frame, on the doctor's time frame, on the, the woman's time frame, then you need to make her, her system accommodate getting pregnant, which normally um, there's, there's quite a bit of of interactions that happen there. Yeah, give us the steps. Okay. I mean, this is so involved. I mean, and one thing we didn't mention with uh, men, sometimes they need to amplify the number of sperm. Yes. Um, that would be as complicated as that part gets. But with the women, all these steps. So so if you go down this path of in vitro, and I think you made the great point, Chris, that a lot of people don't really actually decide to go on the path. They decide to take the next steps to the path, and mm -hmm. they realize there's 10 more steps after that path. And then they realize, like, at the end of it, oh, I had to choose? What am I choosing here, right? <laughs> I often hear patients say, we felt like we stepped on a conveyor belt that yeah. ended in IVF, and there was no exit. Absolutely. We just wanted to ask a question, and the next thing we knew, we were in an IVF cycle. Yeah. So the start of it then is to get a woman prepared to give eggs. So to get a woman prepared for eggs, then you need to control when she's going to ovulate and you need to then control how much she ovulates. So before you start harvesting eggs, you then have to put her at some point previously on birth control to control her cycles because you don't want her ovulating on a Saturday. You need her ovulating when you are able to retrieve the eggs. So the first thing you do is you put them on uh, oral contraceptives uh, to, to control uh, the their hormonal stimulation of ovulation. Then as they get close to when you want her to ovulate, then you hyper-stimulate them because you don't want just one egg or two eggs. You want like 20 eggs um, because, it, because then the next steps are going to be you know, more complicated. So you, want, you give them uh, medicines to hyper-stimulate them. You then track that hyper-stimulation. And when it looks like you have enough eggs that have reached a, a mature enough um, size, then you give her more hormones than to get her ready to ovulate. And, and, but then you also are doing some tests during this time too, right? Blood tests, ultrasound in, through the vagina to yes. look at the ovaries. I mean, that's incredible. And then how do you get the eggs out? So 
So, that, so that's, a, that's also a real point here. So one of the big distinctions between in vivo and in vitro is whose expertise is important here? And, and is their expertise important? Mm -hmm. So in man and woman, man and women have not had to have biology class, haven't had to have <laughs> medical degrees to make babies, right? Right. In fact, it's so easy to make babies that people make babies sometimes accidentally, <laughs> yes. right? Uh, with, without, without forethought. This in vitro requires a lot of forethought. It takes a lot of expertise and a lot of techniques. So the, the way we know which hormones to give is through years and years and years of study of, of these hormones. We know which, which ones to hyperstimulate you are years and years and years. So along the way then, we also then are monitoring this with more technique. So ultrasounds, with biopsies, with blood tests. And think about each one of those requires a kind of expertise and technique that that is that is essential to that process. So no one person could do all the steps. I just read an incredible article. I can't remember how I got onto this. Was it's a it's a famous article now um, called "No One in the uh, Eye Pencil." Right. No one can make a pencil. No mm -hmm. one can make a pencil. And so and it goes through like all of the insane number of steps that yes. even a pencil takes, which is a lot simpler than what you're talking about now. <laughs> Ultrasounds, biopsies. But you know, needles. listeners, if you're if you're driving, pull over for a second. Don't crash on account of me. But just like every parent is going to have to answer the question, how does the baby get out? We need to answer the question, how does the egg get out? And I think a lot of women are surprised to learn that it takes a needle passing through the vagina into the pelvis into the ovary to suck that egg out. We call it aspirate. Or multiple eggs. Yes, and multiple passes sometimes. And that isn't often talked about until she finds the needle headed her way. But it's no easy matter, to your point. It takes a lot of technique to get this thing that can't even be seen with the naked eye out of the ovary. Not an easy task at all. So, so once, once they're out, once the eggs are out into the lab, then what? So then, uh, then you need you need to have conception, right? <laughs> so here, sperm by their nature will fertilize an egg. But to back to your point about sometimes it's not so simple. What if what if men have infertile Im immoral right. sperm? Mm -hmm. uh, what if men have problems with their vas deferens? They have blockages in getting it. So there are more techniques there that you can take one by one a pipette and have a sperm mm -hmm. uh, using uh, intr ICSI intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where you take the sperm and you inject it into the egg. So it's instead of putting the egg in with a bunch of fertile sperm, they can just take one sperm and inject it into the egg for ICSI. Yes. Wow. But whenever you're whenever you're going for fertilization even in vitro you're already looking at these things you're not just taking one egg and one sperm you're looking at the quality of the egg and the wow. quality of the sperm and so there's articles written there's techniques there's expertise on this about how do you know which eggs are good and which sperm are good amazing okay so then conception happens in glass on glass then what i mean how long does it stay on glass well that depends on what you want to do with it so, um, the, so pre-implantation genetic diagnoses is a really hot field in artificial reproductive technologies. In the last 10 years, um, it went from a 5% of, of embryos undergo uh, PGD uh, to now it's almost 50%. So to clarify for listeners, PGD means checking out how good the product is before putting it back in to the womb, back in the uterus. So that's what the PGD is. So, pre so PGD stands for pre-implantation genetic diagnoses. So how do you then get pieces of the embryo to test it for uh, cystic fibrosis, to test it for uh, sickle cell anemia, to test it for BRCA mutations that give you increased breast cancer. breast cancers, right? Uh, to test it for sex. So PGD is, is uh, you need pieces of the embryo. The problem is that the embryo starts out as one cell, then right. two cells, then four cells, and eight cells. And so the more the, the the fewer cells you have, the more dangerous it is to biopsy the embryo. Certainly. So if you wait a little bit longer, then you can you have more cells, and taking pieces of those cells uh, are not as dangerous to the embryo to where if you biopsy, you won't necessarily kill the embryo. Well, at least this is different than eugenics, right? This is exactly <laughs> eugenics. <laughs> yes, uh, it so, is. So eugenics means good genes, and that's exactly what PGD is going for. You're going for the good genes. Well, that's what we were talking a little bit about in the intro. So uh, especially for Catholic listeners or any listener that understands life begins when sperm and egg unite, maybe the couple gets 10, 12, 15 fertilized eggs, which now we call embryos, which we would call little bitty children. Right. Um, and they're going to test them to tell you which are the good ones? Yes. You know, and there's no reason that, of course, that test could be, tell me which one has Down syndrome. It could also be which one tells me is a boy with blue eyes. 
Uh, and that's an uncomfortable thing, but it isn't often presented in that transparent way, is it? No, absolutely not, right? So you think uh, the good side of PGD would be, well, there's this recessive gene that runs in my family that kills people when they're right, young. Yeah. And so why would we want to pass that on, right? And so you can see this sort of good motive there that sure. we, we, we want to prevent disease and suffering. And so we can choose then the ones that don't have it. But then while you're doing it, if you had the ability to choose, you know, I've got seven boys and right. I want I want a girl. Yeah. And this isn't actually that far-fetched of a scenario. There, there's famous scenarios where people have had children, sex-selected embryos for family balancing is what they call it, to have, you know, we, we have all boys, we want a girl. We have all girls, we want a boy. And so now, are you choosing against some disease there? Now you're choosing sex. Then why wouldn't you make them taller? Why wouldn't you? <laughs> right. It's just the slippery slope. <laughs> As they say, one thing follows another. And then you said, you know, 15 embryos. Well, women aren't giving birth to these 15. So what happens to these little itty bitty babies so it depends on when you're doing pgd so uh so now it's it's about 50 percent of uh ivf cycles involve pgd uh, which which is just amazing with, with all that technique right because pgd what we're talking about right is is dna replication transcription understanding which genes do what right yes. so all those techniques but it takes time even though we do it faster now it takes time so if you're, if you're going to do PGD, then you're probably going to be doing it on a later embryo. The problem with that is the woman who has just been hyperstimulated and given ACG, her, her uterus also has a clock that it's not equally ready for implantation then at all times. So what they found actually is doing the hyperstimulation, the HCG, and then waiting that long, you've actually kind of missed your window for uh, implantation. So what they'll end up doing is if you're going to do PGD, which now half of them are, you're, you're basically committing yourself to uh, cryopreservation of the other embryos. So you freeze the tested embryos for the next cycle when she could receive it into her uterus and then continue. For whatever cycle. Oh, you yeah, could, any you could, cycle. You could freeze yeah. them indefinitely, which, I mean, you can freeze them for a time more convenient to you 10 years from now. Sounds like science fiction. Well, moving along this natural, no pun intended, this logical course of events, now there's embryos that, let's say the, the testing was positive and good, and now we're going to put those embryos back in the woman's uterus. And just like any embryo, they could split. And so what if I put four in, and they all split. Now we've got eight pregnancies inside this woman's uterus. That's not good. Uh, what do we do about that? Well, so, so, so why are you putting four? <laughs> yeah. You're putting four in because probably they're not going to most likely split. They're going to die. Right. Or, or they, they haven't conceived, right? Even though you've done all the work on trying to figure out which ones are the best, mm -hmm. which ones are dividing correctly, which are the, the sort of best chromosomal analysis, your IVF costs money. And so they, they want to get as much as they can out of the process. Every cycle costs, you know, on the order of $25,000. If you're older and you need more uh, treatments and more work, it can cost $100,000. So people are incentivized to not do this over and over and over. And uh, I'm sure you can talk to us, uh, Chris, that people don't like being pregnant all the time. <laughs> so so you, you don't want to continually trying to make people pregnant, right? So, mm. so you put in four, depending, you may put in two, you may put in three, you may put in six, mm. depending on the woman's age, how many previous cycles of IVF she's had, has she had miscarriages before, knowing that many of those are not going to take. But the risk is that someone, some of them are going to take and some are going to split. So then you have to decide. So there was a woman... Um, five, six years ago now, uh, Octomom, remember? She, yes, she made, yes. she made yeah. uh, headlines because she delivered octuplets mm -hmm. uh, through, through in vitro fertilization. And the reason why that's not good, right? It's not good for the mother. It's not good, it's not good for the babies. Having multiple twins or, you know, have all sorts of complications that singletons don't have, triplets have more than trends. So then you have to have these discussions that, well, now three have taken. Um, do you want to engage in triplet pregnancy, which increases your risk for miscarriage, which increases your risk for all the, the pregnancy-related complications? It increases your risk of not having any babies. Yeah. And you've paid yeah. $25,000 to get here. Probably this is maybe your second cycle you've done this. So then you have to decide which one. Well, I love the phrase male. selective reduction, right? That's the phrase they love to use. Which of these embryos, babies, inside your uterus could we destroy 
to try to protect you getting one because you didn't want three after all. And they use that beautiful phrase, selective reduction. We're going to have to take a break there and let people really think about that. But we'll hear a lot more from our expert after the break here on Dr. Doctor. Welcome back to Dr. Doctor and a fascinating discussion on in vitro fertilization. So we've, we've sort of talked about this selective reduction. There are too many babies in the uterus. So to try to help at least one of them survive, we're going to destroy the others. What's the real moral question here? I mean, isn't that just an example of an amazing technology that we've been able uh, to develop? What's the moral component to this? Yeah, I think there's a lot of dipoles to this situation. And this one, we started out talking about flow versus hyperfocus. We talked about animal versus God. We talk about the relation that parents have with their children, right? So why is it wrong to selectively reduce? What that means, right, is you're choosing which person to kill. Mm. So why, why, why is it okay for man to kill animals, but we can't kill each other? Well, that's because animals are not like us. Animals are beneath us, whereas each other, we're equals to them. So who can kill people, though? Well, God. God kills. God has killed people. The mm. flood, right? Sodom. Onan. <laughs> so, so the issue is, what those lessons we're supposed to learn there is that there's a difference in, in order of being. Mm. And the reason why God can do those things to us is that we are his creation. The reason why we can do those two animals is because they are of our dominion. Mm. But children, we don't have dominion over. We have communion with. Okay, sim let's simplify this now. Say that they only harvested one egg. They got it you know, uh, fertilized, and then they implanted that one. So there's no selective reduction. So then that argument about playing God and reducing the number of children doesn't play in. What other argument would play in? It doesn't, go, it doesn't play into God's wrath, but it, doesn't, it does play into God's creative nature and god is creator and man is a maker the only things we create are ideas right wow. so that's adam and eve again that's adam genesis one what does man do well man names so it's this kind of idealized making but uh -huh. we don't actually make when god thinks god makes when man thinks man thinks we create things in our mind we make everything else when you are then making babies that is taking this thing of infinite worth, which is a human being, and treating it as if it were just any other thing of nature that we can manipulate. A commodity. Yes. You know, it, it seems so simple, but yet it seems so important to point out, we're talking about the dignity of the human person. It just happens to be a very little one. But, you know, people have dignity simply because they're people. They're created in the image and the likeness of a good and just God. So every person deserves treatment with that dignity not to be cast aside in a laboratory right that's why you want babies so much <laughs> right we want babies so much because babies are of infinite worth mm. they really are this great good but because they are of infinite worth because they are this great good you can't just treat them any way you want to mm. and so i think that's that's this paradox here is that we really are by nature driven to have more of our own bone of my bone flesh of my flesh but that also means you need to respect nature. You need to respect the nature of the thing. And if the nature of the thing is equal to you, you have to treat it as an equal, not oh. as something beneath you. Interesting. Yeah, so it is all about personhood. Mm -hmm. So then that leads into the, uh, the question we wanted to ask you about, how is IVF dehumanizing then? So what does it mean to be a human being? And, and what does it mean to be equal to your parents? So to be a human being, if you look at us, if you look at this from many different perspectives. So in, in my class, I try to avoid theology because it's a class on philosophy. Sure. And I'm a physician, so I, I try to bring in as much science, right? So my class is biological, psychological, sociological, and philosophical. And I, and I try to avoid dogma. I try to yes. avoid the good book on this when it speaks dogmatically. So what is it to be a human being? Well, we're, we're this kind of creature that requires biparental care. If you look at us, we're the most immature species <laughs> when we're born. Like, we, so think about yes. a, a deer when they're when they're born. A deer is up and running within minutes, right? right. If you think about uh, sea anemones or starfish, yes. right? they need no time in uh, with, with their parents, right? <laughs> right. If you look at then at primates, primates take a little bit more time. And then if you look at us compared to the rest of primates, it's it's orders of magnitude more time that we are functionally, sociologically biologically immature so then that has all these repercussions about what it means for 
parents and children, right? So for reproductive success, it's not just that you get your genes to the next generation. You need to get your genes to the next generation, and then that generation needs to propagate them. Mm. So for Homo sapiens to be successful, we need to have children that then become parents. That takes years. Yes. So then if it's years, and then how complex we are, and then all the other things we do sociologically, psychologically, that takes this immense period of socialization that requires two people. So the norm, the norm is two parents caring for one child and, a comp and complementary sexes, right? So the, the women and men offer different things to the child. So that's one way of saying then that a child deserves both parents. If we really are this godlike creature roaming the planet, mm. then we deserve to get the best. And the best is two parents who are related to that child that have a vested biological, psychological, sociological interest in them. So then IVF. IVF, it doesn't really matter who the sperm is. IVF doesn't uh, really matter um, it, how involved the father was. We have IVF now of, we have people conceived by IVF who one or both parents were dead when they were conceived. There's been Supreme Court mm -hmm. cases about do children conceived by IVF deserve Social Security benefits if the, they're conceived after the father who was the Social Security <laughs> beneficiary is dead? Oh, my goodness. That's where we're at now. Well, so, I've certainly seen ugly, ugly arguments in divorces oh, what do you over do with the, the treatment of the frozen embryos. And, and in the legal matters that are cited, this is property law. Yep. Yeah. These aren't children. This is property which to my earlier comments, children are not property. They're not a right, they're a gift. Um, but, but, when they're, but when they're in a cryopreservation tank, mm. it looks a lot like property. Sure. Right, and that's the dehumanizing aspect of it. Yes. It's, it's, it's undignified mm. for us to have ever been cooled to minus 400 with you know, acetone, right? I mean, it's, it's undignified for us ever, of, of a member of our species to be treated that way by a member of our species. Now, in the notes for your class, you have this line that children conceived through IVF are not equals of their parents. What does that mean, William? So children conceived naturally, okay, yes. um, for, by fate, by fortune, um, they will have some of the qualities of their parents, right? And that's, that's one of the reasons why we love our children, right? Mm -hmm. You love your children because you see in them you, or you see in them better, your spouse. Yes. <laughs> or, 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 but that's also why you have compassion for them. Like, I know what he's about to do. I know what he's thinking. Oh, this poor child, right? And so you have this relationship because you are in them and this woman you love is also in them. And then there's something else. Like, you know, so we have three kids now and what we, what we now know is that parenting actually doesn't matter. Uh, that my kids, we do the same thing and I have three different results. So uh, it's, it's kind of freeing. I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, but, it's, but it's a testament to, I thought, I mean, they're half me, half her. How many different permutations that can be? And then they're completely unique, right? Yes. IVF, you are choosing not to have that gene defect. You are choosing to have that sex. Mm -hmm. It may be that you choose that eye color, right? That's a different kind of relationship that my kids may be uh, good at math and, and, and bad at baseball, and they may inherit those things, but I didn't make them that mm. way. Whereas if we are now, especially with PGD, we, we can select for it, but even without PGD, you are treating them as a product that the skill and techniques of the artisan, especially here, the physician, and all of the people that were involved in the ultrasounds and the, in the needles and the hormones mm -hmm. and cryopreservation techniques, all those things are all focused in a technical way on your child that is very different than what happens through natural reproduction. Fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to think of it, this idea that, you know, unwanted pregnancies don't have value, but wanted pregnancies do have value. We don't put value on a child based on what we think about it. You know, it's got value simply because it right. exists. Uh, and we have to treat it that way as a fellow member of the species, as you point out. Which is why there are things that you, that children are owed. And I'm not talking children's rights. I'm talking the dignity of the person. Mm. So the dignity of the person, John Paul II said in, uh, when he was Carol Watiwa, right, said the only proper response to a person is love. Mm -hmm. uh. So that's, we are the kind of being who demands love just by our being and manipulating, 
creating through technical expertise, choosing this defect or that accoutrement, that is not love. That is not willing the good for the other's sake, for the other's sake, right? Mm -hmm. That's willing the good for them for whatever purposes I have. I want a baby who's blonde, blue-eyed, male, and tall. That's about me, that's not about sure. them. Ooh. You know, and I know I've seen so many times in my practice where couples did not know this was an issue. They're capable of knowing that these issues exist, but the industry, if you will, doesn't really disclose that information, probably because those in the industry don't believe it, I suppose. Um, but the couples, once they learn these things, often change their minds because it's, it's hard to listen to you and not feel convicted on these topics. Mm. Um, I think it's also fascinating to think about, uh, we've talked a lot about St. Paul VI and Humana Vitae. He pointed these very oh, things absolutely. out before IVF even existed. I mean, he wrote his encyclical in the 60s. He was just getting kicked around IVF. Didn't really show up until early 70s. But he was spot on. He warned about sort of the inventorying of people and humans. You can't treat them like products, and you can't grade them. Some they aren't people that are better humans than other people. Not in the true sense of the word. They're we, people that that we like better than other ones. But we absolutely grade embryos, right? right? I mean, that's that's some you of the, the some of the titles of the papers that I'm I'm reading to prepare for my class. It's about embryo grading. They get a letter just like in school. Absolutely. A, B, C, or D. You want all A embryos? Yeah. It is. It is. A, it's daunting to think that way. William, you mentioned uh, to me off air that you wanted to mention something else about the, the connection to IVF and hyperfocus and flow. So I think there's a number of dipoles here. I think there's a number of uh, uh, polar arguments that are going on. And, and we started this talking about flow and hyperfocus. So you said flow was this sort of interior doing is the purpose. And whereas hyperfocus is this exterior accomplishment of a yes, thing. Yes. Well, I think, and, and you're the one to point this out, which means I'm not as good a friend to Kevin as I thought I was. Um, <laughs> but, but I think what Kevin's getting at there is this difference between imminent and transitive activities, which is a very early philosophical distinction. Uh, it's all over Aristotle. It's in the Nicomachean Ethics. It's, it's in um, the Metaphysics. And the difference between imminent and transitive is imminent activities are doings. Imminent activities stay within the agent. So uh, bravery is an imminent activity. Mm -hmm. One is made brave by doing brave acts. And you look at the man to determine, is he brave or not? Transitive activities go from the agent to an object. So the the purpose of a transitive activity are, are makings. So that it it leaves the agent and goes to the object. So that a carpenter makes a chair, and how good a carpenter carpenter is, how good that activity of carpentry he's just done is, is not measured by the him. It's measured by the object. Right. It's measured by the chair. Mm -hmm. So the chair is the measure of the carpenter, whereas the man is the measure of bravery. So I think that's that's along the same lines as this hyperfocus and flow is that flow is an imminent activity, hyper hyperfocus would be this transitive activity. What is making a baby supposed to be? Mm. So is making a baby more like making a chair or is making a baby more like a doing where two people come together psychologically, biologically, sociologically, and then are gifted this theological response? It's supposed to be a doing. Yes. So reproduction, to, for two things to create an equal, has to be this imminent activity. If it's treated as a transitive activity, it reduces the person to a thing, to an object. And it's improper to ever treat people merely as objects. They are always subjects. What person ever wants to be treated as an object is one of the things we hate most in life that we rail against. It's probably what's behind so many more lawsuits, so many more people complaining because they're feeling like, especially through this recent pandemic, we've been treated like objects instead of persons. Well, and we've had experts on this show before in relation to pornography talking about yes. the objectification Absolutely. of the of the woman. She's being treated like an object. And there's general agreement that's a bad thing. Yet we're inventorying frozen people, treating them like objects. So it's that objectification that is the problem because you're doing it for good reason. <laughs> Babies are good. Uh, yes. More of us are good. So it's a good motive ultimately behind it. it, it but you want to take a child. Because, absolutely. It's the good motive, but then that motive is so important or that, that thing, that, that person is so important that there are things you can and cannot do to them so that you do not objectify. So what, what is the limit of what the church will allow in this area? 
Well, said differently, let's put you on the spot for listeners. You know, uh, in a in a one sentence or more, I guess. <laughs> we, we, uh, most listeners would say, "Yeah, I know the church says you can't do IVF," and the question that I struggle to answer quickly sometimes is, "Why? Why not IVF? Yes. Why not IVF? Because we're not gods. No. Nah. So IVF is a making of new people, and that is not the nature of our species." Hmm. So what can we do to assist this? What's the limits of what we can do? Well, that's it, the assistance. So that's the, that's the difference. So what is licit and what is not licit? Anything that turns reproduction into making, anything that turns begetting, anything that turns conception into a art, to a mm. technique, that is a making, that's a transitive activity that dehumanizes, that is beneath the dignity of the human person. And the result is a product. And the result is, it's a person, yeah. but it's a person who's treated like a product. Sure. The things you can do then or anything that allow reproduction, allow the marital act, allow conception to maintain its imminent activity. So you can assist, but you cannot replace. So the assistance, so things that assist the reproductive act, those are illicit. Things that replace the reproductive act are not. So what does the church say about all these frozen embryos? Uh, that it's a hard question. So John Paul II is one of the most brilliant minds of, of ever. And uh, he, he tackled this a couple of times. Uh, and Benedict XVI also uh, tackled this as well. And you, you read John Paul II and you can tell there's always more. right? He's this poet. He's this philosopher. He's this yes. theologian. He's got so much. He's not going to tell you all of it. right? You read Donum Vitae or Dignitatis Personae about what to do with frozen embryos. And the, 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 the documents say, this is a problem that doesn't have a good solution. Uh -huh. That is an awful, awful, like I, every time I read, I teach it in my class, every time I read it, I'm like, there's this pit in my stomach. And, and what he means by that is, it's what do you do with these frozen embryos, right? So is it good? So, and, and the scale of the problem is a problem, right? That, that we're not, so in Donna Vitae and Donna Persona, they act like there's like thousands of frozen embryos. There's probably millions right, sure. of frozen embryos. And in the United States, we do IVF way less than Europe does IVF. So the problem in Europe is even even more. Yeah. So the problem is you've got these frozen embryos. Are you going to give someone 20 kids? Are you going to give them 20 different parents? Are you going to destroy them? Are you going to leave them there forever? And so what they say is stop doing it. That's what the answer is to this problem is stop freezing people. Arguably, it's a problem we should have never encountered. And it's that running debate about science. Is it okay to do it? We'll manage it later. Well, it, it doesn't work that way. Well, William, in the couple of seconds we have left here, what are your final comments for listeners? Yeah, back to the beginning about who are the people created in these events. They are beings of infinite worth. They have souls. They have a unique love from God, and that's the problem, that they are, they are dehumanized, de-dignified, treated in a way beneath them, and we need to love all of them equally. William, you have been a tremendous guest again. Thank you for giving a power-packed uh, education on injury to fertilization. We, we'll probably have you back again. I appreciate God it. Bless. Thank you. Welcome back to Dr. Doctor, and it's time for the answer of this week's trivia question, and it deals with gametes, which astute listeners know, that's a fancy medical way to say sperm. Right, at least the male form the of male gametes. The male version, yeah, that's right. So, so every time that there is the marital embrace, roughly how many sperm are released? So it's in uh, multiples of 10. Is it closer to 10,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, or 100 million? Well, William wasn't kidding when he said that eggs were valuable, really, really valuable compared to sperm, because for every time that there is one egg available, there's about 100 million sperm released, and sometimes more. That is just an incredible number. Yeah, and most of them do nothing but just swim around looking for directions. <laughs> yeah. Are they really looking for directions? <laughs> <laughs> you know, another bit of sort of corollary trivia is that it takes men about 90 days to make and mature one of those 100 million sperm. Ah. So it, it's fun to say it takes us men 90 days to do what our spouses can do in 30. Yes. Well, <laughs> that's not too much of a surprise. So, so Chris, uh, three things, top three. Yeah, top three takeaways. That's what we're looking at from Williams. You know, that was just incredible. Well, we always know it's been a good show when we struggle to pick a top three. Yes. Not because there's not three, because there's too many more than three. But I, I, I think... 
we have to include uh, on that list this concept of personhood. And we've talked about this so many times, whether it's abortion or end-of-life care. But I think he did a great job of pointing out that the humans created in this process, just like in the natural process, are persons. They're not property. Correct. And so they must be treated with dignity because uh, they're persons. And of course, Humana Vitae did such a beautiful job of pointing that out. Listeners, if you haven't read Humana Vitae, you just have to Google it uh, and read it. A, a second one I, I like to point out is that idea about we're not gods. We can assist the process, but we can't replace it. So in my work in fertility, I'm trying to repair or assist in the natural processes that may be broken, but I don't get to replace them because we're not gods. We're not allowed to choose amongst our own species. We have dominion over the animals, but we don't have dominion over other humans because they're persons. And then I think last, we can't say this enough, the children born of IVF procedures are children of God, they're persons, they have infinite value and the same dignity of children that are not born that way. It's just critical to point that out. This concept that children have infinite value, whether they're desired or not, their desire, a wanted pregnancy, doesn't have any more value than a so-called unwanted one. But children are a gift, they're not a right, they're not property. Well said. Good note to end on for this episode. Thanks for being with us for another edition of Dr. Doctor, the award-winning radio program and podcast hosted by members of the Catholic Medical Association. We ask you, share the good news of Dr. Doctor with a friend. Invite them to listen on their favorite podcast app. You can also find this and all of our episodes on our website, drdoctor.org. And if you want to dig a little deeper into some of the topics, check out our website for bonus links and information in our posts for each episode. This is Dr. Tom McGovern. And this is Dr. Chris Stroud. And we're signing off until your next dose of Dr. Doctor. The views expressed on Dr. Doctor do not necessarily represent those of your co-host. Have a question for our doctors or a topic you'd like to hear about? Call or text your questions to the Holy Cross College text line at 260-436-9598 or fill out the form at drdoctor.org. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Dr. Doctor Show and tune in for new episodes every Friday. Plus, find all our past episodes at drdoctor.org.